a couple of quick samples here on the network segmentation, if that wasn't clear there. Here we have a sample diagram, just typical environment. The servers highlighted in red down along the bottom indicate those systems that are, in this case, are handling credit card data directly, storing it, transmitting it, et cetera. So you have some application servers, some database servers, et cetera. Those are the ones touching card data. In this kind of an environment, the scope of PCI compliance would look something like this. In other words, everything would be in scope. Why? Remember that connected systems rule. All these various connected systems that are in those same segments automatically in scope. And even these satellite offices, because they're just connected by a point-to-point -point router, and in this case, we're saying that that does not have a firewall feature set on it for the techies on the line, that would be considered a flat network, and they are in scope. If everything is firewalled neatly and segmented, then you have different options. So in this case, we would not recommend just going ahead and starting to remediate. We would say, let's first improve our segmentation. Let's hang a couple of new interfaces off of our firewall, or maybe deploy some new firewalls. And let's segment out those systems that are handling card data. And we can then reduce our scope potentially to something like this. Now, it's not that simple. And you have to talk through all the specifics of maybe, for example, how are these end users dealing with card data? If they are, they can get pulled into scope. But then there's things like thin client solutions that you can use to then, again, keep them out of scope. We don't have time to get into all that today. But the point is, segmentation done right can drastically reduce scope and then the cost for PCI. So it's well worth working on. Data tokenization is also well worth considering. This is a rapidly evolving field. Uh, you will find many people offering this now. I've listed out some of the players here. This is just a very short list. There are many others. Uh, a couple of the ones that uh, we've, we've dealt a lot with lately, you know, Chase Payment Tech is, is, has gotten a lot into this. Uh, Braintree deals heavily with this. Shift4, they're the guys that kind of pioneered it. Authorize.net and Akamai are two guys that are getting a lot of play lately. Um, so a lot of a lot of players getting into this. A lot more every day. Uh, we're not uh, certainly uh, recommending or or uh, you know uh, backing anybody here. Just kind of listing some examples that you can go and check out for yourselves. But uh, there's a lot of people. We always recommend, by the way, that you start with your acquiring banker processor, whoever you're already doing business with, because there's a good chance that they're already offering something like this or will be soon and you're, you want to leverage your existing relationship uh, and fee structure as much as you can. So just a quick overview. If you haven't heard of or if you're not familiar with tokenization, uh, it's, it's basically about redirecting card data so that it does not go through your environment. Typical environment, it might go through your website, for example, in an e-commerce setup. That card data might be stored. Everything's in scope then. With tokenization, you're using a third party in a way that the card data is going from the end user browser straight to the third party, and all your web server is getting back is an authorization code. Card data never hits your server. You can actually keep your stuff out of scope when you do this. That's about all we're going to be able to get into that today because we are going to have to keep this high level, but it is something well worth exploring. There is also in-house tokenization that can be explored, which lets you do the same thing but centrally tokenize to a single centralized data store internally. These are all things we can talk about in more detail with a follow-up if you'd like, but data tokenization is a rapidly evolving technology and service. It's well worth looking at if you haven't already. End-to-end -end encryption is also a very popular and rapidly evolving option that is worth taking a look at. Not as far along as data tokenization, so you need to be careful, but it's very encouraging in terms of its potential of what it can do when it's implemented right. This deals with encrypting the card data right at the point of swipe, in the card swipe terminal in a manner where you don't have the keys on premises to decrypt that data. A third party has the keys. And in that way, you can actually keep all of the systems in that environment, aside from the terminals themselves, out of scope. Because, and this is the only thing I'll point out here, this is important, the council has basically rendered an unofficial opinion here saying that if you have card data that's encrypted in a way that you do not have the keys on premises to decrypt it, that can be considered not to be card data. So that can be a very attractive option for people who do have a processor and terminals that would support end-to-end -end encryption. You need to have all the right pieces for that to work. OK, I'm going to have to move on quickly here so that we can cover the last couple of slides. As I mentioned, you're going to want to use the prioritized approach, which the council makes available. And we can get you some links as a follow-up here. But that's going to help you to prioritize what you're doing first, second, third, et cetera. That breaks down into six prioritized milestones, which you see here. Not going to spend time on those because, again, this is all available on the Council's website for you. 
And then ultimately what you want to build towards is some kind of a program where you have ongoing maintenance of controls. You want to have some kind of ongoing assessing, remediation as needed, some ongoing validation checks, whether you need an on-site assessment or maybe this is an internal assessment. You're going to want to have an ongoing program such that you have activities happening throughout the year to ensure compliance and to ensure that these things are being maintained. The form of that will, of course, vary across organization, but think about this as a program, not a project. So I have to wrap up with Section 3 very quickly because we're already coming up on time here. So I'm just going to cover in a couple of minutes here some of the recent developments, but unfortunately we'll have to save some of this for a future session where we'll be getting more focused on these individual topics. The good news is not a lot has changed for version 2, for those of you who are looking forward to hearing a lot about that. A lot of clarifications of language. Some, uh, I would say, more benefits than otherwise. In other words, the changes work more to your advantage than the reverse. They, there are several requirements that give you a little bit more flexibility in terms of how you apply the requirement, especially around the coverage of intrusion detection, which they've backed off on a little bit, and regarding how you control outbound traffic uh, from, from Section 1 of the DSS. Those are a couple of key areas that they really kind of made a little easier for you based on industry feedback. And they also added in a lot of language around virtualization, basically just clarifying that it's okay to do VM stuff, but PCI certainly still applies in a virtualized environment. One thing that I definitely want to touch on briefly is MasterCard's new rules. If you're a level two merchant, this especially applies to you. As of June 30th of 2011, so right now, and I'll follow up on that in a moment, Level 2 merchants who currently can do a self-assessment, that's all changing at the end of this month. Okay? If you're a Level 2 merchant, you are going to have to then have an on-site assessment by a QSA or have internal staff go through this new training program by the council and maintain this certification of internal security assessor, much like the QSA, but for organizations internally. Now, the current deadline is June 30th, the end of this month. That's a big deal for any of you Level 2s out there. Now, if you're in that position, the first thing I recommend is that you reach out to your acquiring bank. A quick strategy for you, I recommend that you talk to them about, can I submit a self-assessment prior to the end of this cycle, prior to the end of June? Will, that, will you then allow me to reset my deadline? In other words, give me until a year from then to do this on-site validation. I've seen a lot of banks approve that approach. It's the banks that have to approve that. It's up to them. So you might want to ask about that. But the other thing to be aware of here is, that verbally we have been told by internal MasterCard employees that they are getting ready to announce that this deadline is going to be pushed back by a year. So probably none of you have heard this yet, but if that is true, I cannot guarantee it because it has not been published yet, but we have been told by somebody currently employed on the MasterCard compliance team that they will be publishing this notice soon and that this deadline will get pushed back to June 30th of 2012. You can't rely on that yet until it's official, but start talking to your acquiring bank about your options if you're in this level two category. Okay, states are implementing laws around PCI. I don't have time to go into this, but the one thing I do want to touch on is Nevada has got a very strong law mandating full PCI compliance for anyone doing business with anyone in that state. Washington state is a little unique for a different reason. This is the one that really actually helps you guys. It basically says that if you can show compliance by means of having validated, it gets you off the hook to some degree. It says that the banks cannot come after you for certain fines and penalties. The interesting thing there is that they do not necessarily recognize in the law the difference between the validation and actually being compliant. Kind of a flaw in my mind, but the current language is that if you have the right paperwork to show that you were validated, that's going to work to your advantage based on the Washington law. So just an interesting note there. So we don't have time for anything else today. We, are have, we have some useful links here that will be made available to you as a follow-up if you'd like to reach out to uh, Chris here and request that information. And at this point, I'm going to hand this over to Chris Lang, who will kind of wrap things up and talk to you about how to uh, get a hold of us for any follow-ups. Great. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, so my name is Chris Lang, and uh, I know we've covered a lot of ground today, and just want to be respectful respectful of everyone's time, and if uh, people would like to send specific questions or comments to me directly, uh, my email address and telephone number are up on the screen. I'm more than happy to put you in touch with the right people and get you the answers uh, that you need. And if uh, those of you that are still uh, around would like to stay for a question and answer sent, uh, session, we can get to that uh, uh, now. 